Afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Looks like that's working. I'm Steve. I'm <coughs> going to be talking about writing code that's testable by design. Um, this isn't a TDD talk, although I might mention it a little bit on the way because it's informed some of what I want to talk about. But it's about designing code to be testable. So I don't know how many of you were in Peter's talk upstairs um, in the previous session for the um, kind of the YouTube audience. Hi, um, welcome to. Peter was talking about dependency injection from the perspective of injecting dependencies into existing code bases. And so I'm kind of coming at it from a slightly different direction about trying to think about how to manage dependencies when you're designing code. But there is a certain amount of overlap on that because refactoring existing code is famously changing the design of existing code. So it's still thinking about design. And along the way, I want to also explore a little bit about the modern C++ features. I'm oh, sorry. Louder. Louder. <laughs> OK, I'll try. Um, some modern C++ features that help with code clarity and with testability and why those two things matter. Um, and so while but I don't want to be presenting loads of modern, this isn't about um, presenting modern sort of C++ 20, 23, 26 upcoming features. This is more about production ready C++ where some modern features I think are going to prove to be important or are already important. Um, so a little bit of an outline of the talk. Tell, don't ask is a, um, a phrase that I hear bandied about a little bit. It's not a new thing. It's really about the idea of keeping behavior and data encapsulated in one place. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's rather than, um, it's sometimes used um, the other way up about ask, don't tell. And we'll make that comparison too. Um, Parameterize from above is a phrase that, um, certainly for me, dates back to the early days of my programming career. Um, I first heard it used by Kevin Henney some decades ago, and it underpins what I think uh, Peter also was explaining about dependency injection, about passing things in and not reaching out for a global or a singleton or whatever it is. So um, there's a little bit of parallelism there. I want to look at some, um, what I think in C++ feature terms are sometimes below the fold, if you see what I mean. They're not the big headline things, although some of the things I think I'm going to talk about may be above the fold a little bit more. But I'm going to have a think about standard chrono, about class template argument deduction, um, smart pointers, initializers, concepts. Those are all going to come into the mix, but it, it's not a feature gallery. I'm going to introduce those things when I think they're useful and why. Um, but all of the examples are in C++ 20-ish. A um, couple of places where I think, um, I think I've got some 23, which I'll probably annotate uh, in the code examples. And I'm just using GCC for this. So there's nothing particularly special about the examples. Hopefully, it's all stuff you'll be able to replicate easily for yourselves. Um, it also compiles in Visual Studio. I'm pretty sure it compiles under Clang. So there's, you know, I'm not going to be looking into any particularly dusty corners. I'm also going to um, talk a little bit about naming domain types and um, what, the, what solution architects like to refer to as ubiquitous language. But this also isn't a domain-driven development talk. So it's not DDD, it's not TDD, it's something else. Some of you may know that I'm not really a C++ developer at all. I'm actually a C-sharp developer. I wrote a book about it, which was published last year. But it didn't really help very much in developing this talk. A book that did help me much more was this book, who was written by my wife, Fran, um, which, because I used to do C++, and I lost, I kind of lost touch with it, probably around about C++ 11 or so, maybe, maybe a bit of 14. Um, haven't really done very much since. And this book 
is kind of, I think of it as the bringing you up to speed from around about C++ 11 to the modern day. And I think it's been brilliant. And actually, <laughs> it's been fundamental in writing this talk. So um, with the advertising out of the way, what I want to talk about for the rest of the session is a simple design that's, I think, kind of real world enough. It's not a completely non design um, that has some constraints, um, but without being too big, without trying to think about huge existing legacy code bases, which obviously is pretty hard to do in a 60 minute talk. Um, so I'm going to introduce the idea of a heating controller. So think about your central heating thermostat at home or something similar to that. Um, possibly an embedded device, doesn't matter. Um, going to be thinking about this in reasonably abstract terms. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but we've got some basic requirements for what should be going on So um, and some constraints. So basic requirements that at a certain kind of time of day, you want the heating to come on automatically and then go off automatically at a later time. And probably you want it to be sensitive to the current temperature so that it only comes on if it needs to come up the temperature and goes off if it's already too warm. And that will be handled by a third party API. And so being able to read the temperature and being able to control the system are two separate third party APIs. So in simple pseudo code, it ought to be reasonably straightforward. You're probably doing this in a loop. If you're within the window when you want the heating on, you read the sensor. If it's below the required temperature, you turn the heating on, otherwise you turn it off. <coughs> and if the heating is already on, you leave it where it is. So far, so good, hopefully. Any particular burning questions at this point? Is that reasonably clear? OK. In terms of the third party APIs, well, these might be unknowns for a variety of reasons. Um, the hardware isn't finished yet, or doesn't even exist. You haven't decided on who you're going to use for the third party APIs. They're being developed somewhere else in the company, or it's, they haven't finished it yet. The list goes on as to why you might have a requirement in your whatever system it is that you're developing for something that's unknown. And this kind of uncertainty is often seen as an impediment to going on, a, a blocker of, well, we don't know how this system, what this system looks like, how it's going to work, what its actual API is going to be, so we can't think about it. And it might inhibit, if you want to do TDD, if you're in a place that uses TDD or you personally you know, like to work that way, it can be seen as a blocker to that as well because it makes it a little bit harder to see where to start. So the first thing I want to explore about design is actually embracing the uncertainty um, where you might want to fill the details in later. But you want to be able to start designing your own system in a way that the choice between A and B, as Kevin Henney puts it, um, or this provider or that provider, this library, that library, whatever it is, can you make that decision less significant both now and later? You still need to identify what the core of that uncertainty is. It might not be as obvious as we've got a third party provider that are going to be providing um, a temperature sensor for us and we don't know what their API is going to be. Some of these uncertainties are a little bit more subtle. But the underlying point is there are some decisions that you can defer. Um, and Kevin's um, got a great talk on this and um, a paper that you can look up about using uncertainty as a driver, literally embracing it and using it as a focus to help you move on rather than being blocked. But the key thing here is that you just take a beat, just take a step back and think about the problem that you're trying to solve and try to identify where those points of uncertainty are. And in a provisional heating system that I described just now, we've got two main concerns going on. The first one is the ability to turn the heating on and off. 
And then the other one is deciding when to do that. So that, and partly that's time-based and partly that's whatever the current temperature is. But apart from this ability, exactly how do we read the current temperature and exactly how do we control the system, everything in between is up to us. And we can start designing that once we've decided where our uncertainty pain points are. These two things about actually activating the system and when to activate the system, we can address them separately. So we start with the easiest thing first, turning things on and off. The heating system itself. So uncertainty is about, we don't know what the API to this uh, system that's going to turn the system on and off is going to be. So let's decide what we want that to look like. Uncertainty drives the imagination. We design the API that we want to see, the way that we want to be able to use it. And we can think about how we might need to change that, possibly, but how we would fit that into the real world when we know exactly what the third-party API is going to look like. So we may, it may need refactoring later, but we begin with the API that we want. So we start with a simple heating system type. Now, C++ and like some of the languages have interface types, which C++ lacks in a, a built-in language sort of way. But um, the classic uh, example of doing that is a pure virtual abstract base class. Um, I think I believe the books for the, um, the buzzword bingo have already gone. So if you're still filling in, sorry. Um, but we just define some pure virtual functions about turn it on, turn it off. There is some admin that we have to do around construction and destruction, which we need to think about. But the basic API is there. Um, and we can also find out what, it's, what the current status of the system is. Is it on or is it off? And that's possibly encoded in our switch on and switch off with the bool returns. Haven't yet decided. It can't, it's a decision that we can defer. So the virtual destructure is mandatory, as I say. There are a few other things that we might want to think about. So rule five about copy construction and assignment, move construction and assignment. And we can default all those in the base class. And if we default those, then we have to think about default construction as well, so rule of six. But there is a school of thought that says it's better to be explicit about these things to show that, that you've at least considered it. There is equally a school of thought that says you can leave them out once you've decided that they're not required. It's not really a relevant point of the design, just something to think about as we're going through. But once we've got our abstract base class in type in, in place, we can use that to create a test double. Um, and faking the behavior that we don't yet know how it's going to work in the real world, but we can fake what we think the API that we have decided we want should be able to work. So don't get too hung up on the terminology about fakes and mocks and stubs and whatever. It's a test double something to stand in for the real thing. The fact that it's a test double, clues in the name, we want to be able to test a system with this. But testing the fake is pointless. <laughs> we don't want to be testing this behavior. This is just something to stand in for our heating controller later in a real test. And here, we don't worry about all of the um, decisions around rule of five, we don't need to. It's encapsulated in the base class. So here we just let the base class do its thing because we've got no lifetime to manage. That's not the point of this class. It's not a resource as such. The real one might be. So as I say, we don't want to test that bit. That's, that's something to support testing. What we need to do is Next is to address the concept of time. So we know we've, we've now got a, a fake component that allows us to switch the system on and off and determine whether it's currently on or currently off. 
Now we need to decide when to do that. So here, we, I introduced the idea of a controller for the system. First pass on, on the implementation. And this is where we get to the tell then ask thing. So this, is, this controller object is an active object. We tell it to do something. We tell it activate. And it's got a reference to the heating system under the hood. And the implementations of these, um, of the activate, will turn it on or turn it off according to the start and end time that we give it. We're going to figure out how to read the current temperature later. But we're not asking for what properties it has and then doing something based on it. We're not asking it. We are telling it activate based on the properties that we've given it in the constructor. So we tell the controller to activate if the time is right for it to do so. It's not perfect, but we can write a test for it. So um, I'm just using Google Test for this. Nothing spectacularly difficult here, hopefully. Um, we create a, a fake heating object, which we then pass into the controller constructor along with a start time and an end time. And here we're just using standard um, chrono durations to represent, um, I can't remember what these numbers are, 8.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon. So come on at 8.30, go off at half past four. And then in a real system, you probably do the control activate in some kind of a loop, probably with a little delay. But for the purposes of our test, all we want to do is determine if we've got, if, if the current time is within the time window that we specified to the controller's constructor, but the system comes on. Does the test pass is the first question. Well, it might do. Um, it depends on the time of day you run the test. So never mind our dependencies on third party APIs. We've got kind of a not very hidden dependency on the time of day. I say it's not very hidden, but I still see the moral equivalent of this fairly frequently. On a weekly basis, might be a little bit strong, but fairly frequently. So it's something to think about that we want to be able to take away the idea of um, this reaching out for the current time. And then raw pointers might be making life more difficult than they need to be. So we used a, um, we've got a unique pointer in the test itself, but the controller object is accepting a raw pointer. Now, the controller is only an observing type here. So the fact that it's, it's not trying to control the lifetime, it's not owning the pointer it's being given, all it needs is using it for access to something else. But even so, the raw pointer is going to make some people possibly twitch, or at least a code reviewer, to give it a good hard stare. And then we've got the duration type for the times. So chrono durations um, with uh, the extension for the, kind of the, the units of time, as we're showing here, um, makes for a nice, neat way of representing a time of day, because a duration is just a duration since midnight, really. Um, but within the controller type, where, if I go back a slide, or two, that one, using standard chrono duration isn't very expressive. So we're going to think a little bit about that as well. Um, but here we're just calling activate, and if we're in the right time of day, the test will pass. But it's only going to pass at a certain time of day. So instead of using chrono duration directly, what if we introduce a little helper type called time window? Now, time window is really, really simple helper type. All you're doing is giving it two durations, in effect, and asking whether a third duration that you provide 
or actually a, a, a real time, is within the window that you specified. And instead of using duration and time point, where well, I mean time point is particularly um, wordy if you want to get the system clock, we can give those slightly more meaningful names within the, the constraints of our design. So a time of day is a duration since midnight. Um, and a wall clock time is something that might be able to represent the time right now. So given this simple type, so simple helper types are, are very helpful. This is easy to test independently of everything else. It's not an active object. So in this case, we are going to be asking it for its properties, in, but slightly indirectly. So we pass in the time that we conceptually want to mean now, and we ask it if it's within the window that we set up in the constructor. It's, it's obviously a very simple test. I haven't actually written a test for it. Um, but again, harking back to somebody else's talk earlier, having Rob Leahy um, was saying that there is no code that's so simple that you don't need to write a test for it. This would fall under that. I haven't. I, so I have written a test for it. I'm just not going to show it. <laughs> but sometimes asking is the right thing to do. So with that in place, we can refactor the controller to make it a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to understand what it's supposed to be doing, and a little bit more testable. Um, so instead of passing in a raw pointer, we're now passing it a shared pointer. Even though it's not really participating in the lifetime of the heating object or the heating system object, it's very difficult to translate from a unique pointer to a shared pointer. And we get the implicit lifetime management almost for free by using shared pointer. Again, there's a school of thought that says using shared pointer is a strong indicator that you're an object that takes a shared pointer is participate, it's an owning object of some kind. Your mileage may vary. I mentioned earlier that. The controller really is genuinely an observer, but we want to be able to have the freedom of not having to manually manage the lifetime of an object externally. So shared pointer fits our bill there. And then activate, we changed its signature so that it takes a wall clock time, according to our um, a kind of type alias that we defined earlier, to represent now. So now our test, we can set that up much more simply. So instead of make unique, we use make shared. But apart from that, we set up the time window with the on and off times that we want, pass that into the controller. And then when we call activate, we pass in a time that we can say either a, an explicit time that we say for now, or this could be the system clock now in real world. And so this is, this is an example of dependency injection. Dependency injection is literally just that, taking your dependencies out from the units of your class. Now, it's possible, um, in my experience, for TDD done strictly to focus testing or for testing to become overly focused on implementation details. This test test explicitly, even though we've, we've not really done it TDD, let's be fair. I said that at the front, it's not a TDD talk. But we're testing for the outcome, not the implementation. We're not testing that the controller goes through all the hoops to do the arithmetic on the times and turn the heating on and off. We just want the outcome. Is the heating on when we expect it to be on? This makes the test less brittle in the face of refactoring later. And it allows us to think at a higher level um, about what we want our controller to be in the, context, you know, in the context of a larger system. It's one reason why the refactor step when in doing TDD is so important. It's about removing that implementation-focused testing in part. But it's a bit that's often forgotten. So we're not done yet. We're only halfway there. Um, we've only got half the requirements done. We've done, we've done the turn it on and off according to the time. What about the temperature? 
So we might think about adding to the API of controller a way of setting our required temperature. So it would, the controller still knows about the on time and the off time. And then it's got a third thing to consider, which is if I'm within the window, am I also below the required temperature? And if I'm below it, I'll turn the heating on, otherwise I'll leave it off. Mentioned earlier that we've got a third party API for reading the temperature. So we foresee that in this API and say, we're not going to hard code the sensor into the controller. The controller, whatever that sensor is going to be, is going to be external. We're just going to pass a value to the set required temperature. So we're already thinking about our dependencies and how we can inject them. Now, we're not injecting a dependency here. We're just using the, de we'll, the dependency is going to provide the value. We're just hard coding the value here, um, but thinking about passing the value in rather than the dependency itself or the sensor, as I'm going to see into the future and say I'm probably going to call it a sensor. Obviously, temperature is one way. <laughs> um, it's only one kind of value. This is the sort of thing that you might want to think. If you're um, designing something, for example, that uses random numbers, where you want to abstract how random numbers are generated, you might want to find a way to inject the random number generator in rather than having it embedded in your type. Another way is that rather than whatever your controller object under those circumstances is, um, knowing about random numbers, it's just given a value that's calculated outside. So it's another way of abstracting away dependencies. We're not really injecting a dependency here, but we are abstracting the idea of it outside of the controller class. Obviously, magic numbers, which I talked about domain types a little bit. That raw 25, think of it as 25 degrees Celsius, kind of ran out of time in producing the talk. Um, for doing that, but it, you can see how that might work. A simple temperature type would do it. But even so, I think we can do better. So here's the sensor. Again, this idea of separating separation of concerns in the code. So separating out the reading, the current temperature from the activating the controller. And this idea of a sensor is kind of an idea of emergent design, a little bit, slightly lightweight on that front. But we already know that we're going to have a third party API for this, which looks a bit like this. We know it's a simple API that just returns an int. So we assume it reads degree centigrade, but perhaps it's a known API this time. Even so, even if it were an unknown API, we could still say, well, this will suffice for the time being, and we'll figure out how to, if necessary, refactor our code to cope with a different API if we're presented with one later. So we've got a way of reading the temperature. We've got a way of abstracting that outside of the controller. And what we're really doing here is, I kind of alluded to this a little bit, a little bit just now, our controller system is got this idea of do I switch the heating on based on the current time and then following on from that based on the current temperature. So perhaps we think a bit about, well, the controller itself doesn't need to know about all of that. We've already set it up so that it knows about time. What about if we introduce the idea of a kind of a thermostat, which is going to be sensitive to the temperature and know nothing about the time. So the controller, as we've got it, would use the thermostat to decide whether to switch the heating on if we were within the time window. And then that looks at the heating system to actually activate the system. In the thermostat itself, we only switch on if the temperature is below our required temperature 
otherwise we'll do nothing. And that's pretty much all it needs to do. So we can introduce a simple, simple, the simple thermostat class, which also um, derives from our abstract heating system because it's got a very, very similar API, even though the switch off is almost redundant in this case. Everything else is pretty much relevant. So it takes, the thermostat takes heating system uh, pointer in its constructor, the thing to control, and then takes the target temperature to keep in its constructor, and then the way to obtain the current temperature, which we're, I'm using uh, a standard function. A so dependency injection via type erasure. So internally to the thermostat, we just call out to that uh, function object, um, which we know is gonna give us an int back, which we assume to be the current temperature. And obviously this is a seam that we can change the underlying behavior of that function by passing in our own can function that might pass in, <coughs> for example, a hard-coded value. So in test code, the hard-coded sensor just stands in for a real sensor, according to our, that has the same signature as our third-party API. So, so far, so good. We can update the controller to do that. And the controller no longer needs to know about the temperature. All it cares about is the time. The thermostat, we pass into the controller's constructor. So the controller filters through the thermostat. The controller decides on whether the, the time of day is correct. Part defers off to the thermostat object to defy, decide if the current temperature is, requires the heating to go on or off. And then the thermostat object activates the heating or not. So the filter kind of drops through the thermostat in a way. So a pattern emerges here. If we kind of slightly overlook the fact that the thermostat isn't using, or the whole API of our base class isn't really relevant. But the idea being that it's sort of just filtering the data through. So perhaps we can use the same pattern to manage the time window slightly better and create and replace our controller with a new timer activator rather than just controller, which is, in fairness, it was always a bit of a vague name for it. So we extend the idea to a timer activator, which again, takes the heating system in its constructor and the, um, the time window as before. But instead of using a function, we're using a template to represent that callable thing. And this is one example where um, the, something like the invocable concept, um, which is definitely a C20 thing, um, makes life easy for us as developers writing the API and makes it understandable for the next programmer who comes along trying to, trying to read it and figure out what, what it's supposed to be doing. You can get much more sophisticated with these concepts to give, you know, give them um, names that fit within your domain, but give, have constraints that are relevant in that case. Here, all we really need is an invocable thing. And so this suffices. So there's this trade-off between, um, it's basically the decision between whether to use a template as a dependency injection scene, or something like a function, standard function, or other type erasure facility as a scene. But the two things work in a very similar fashion. Switching to the template brings some compromise, as we're about to see, but it is faster. Your mileage may vary. I mean, it, honestly, it's going to depend on how often you're going to be invoking these things. If it's thousands of times a second, then you might care. If it's only once a minute, nobody's going to notice, right? It also might be a good time to rename the heating system as a heating activator, the base class, because what, we are, what we're now kind of starting to explore is that this is 
the heating system, the abstract base class is a base class of activators. So we do yes, yet another test. Well, I haven't done that. Um, each part of the chain calls and depends on the next part of the chain. So here we've got a thermostat object, the therm activator, which takes the timer activator object in its constructor. The timer activator takes the heating, the fake heating in its constructor, and they depend on each other in that way. The problem we've got here <coughs> uh, is that we, can't, we, can, we can no longer use make shared because the timer activator is a class template. I'm not quite sure why class type argument deduction won't kick in. Perhaps somebody can enlighten me. I suspect it's because make shared takes a parameter pack. Anyone? If anybody knows the reason why that fails, it, the compiler, please let, you know, come and find me afterwards. I, I would actually quite like to know, but I've not found anything to actually definitively tell me why that fails. So here we're creating raw shared pointers in kind of the normal way, if you like. CTAD is in action when we knew the timer activator. So we don't need to provide template arguments there because they are deduced from the arguments to the constructor. The problem is with make shared, can't deduce those types for us. And we're using shared pointers of the base class in both cases, um, partly because we can, but partly because it's important in the context of the wider system. The point about having a common base class is that these types at some level are interchangeable, they're substitutable for each other. And that's an important part, that's actually a crucial part of dependency injection when you're using an abstract common base class, is that at some level within the system, you can substitute the real implementation for the fake one under test. What substitutability means in your actual system is going to depend on, you know, very much on your environment. But in mechanical terms, it's provided by the abstract base class. But this is going to become a little bit more important in a short while. So we have another, another test here where we can test the activators in place. Um, Oh yes, so timer and stat, even though we're, we're basically writing a test that some people might think of as an integration test, we're looking at several different types. Well, again, this is a terminology problem. They're also testable independently, easily testable independently. Even though they depend on each other in a conceptual way because they take a reference to a different object in a constructor, that's, as we've already demonstrated, easily faked away. So we're not introducing a false dependency that's going to break testing here. That dependency we've already dealt with, so we can still write independent tests for this code. So what if we wanted to extend the idea further? How might we add functionality to override the, the, the system? So. We're outside of the timer window, but the temperature is too cold, so we just want to say, go on for an hour, because my fingers are going blue. Our heating system, or heating activator class, is, it's open for extension, intentionally so. And there are lots of possibilities that you might want to introduce. So here we can add a new activator, an override activator in this case, where the base class API is still the same, where we're going to drop it into our system where they filter through to each other. But we also have type-specific behavior of actually doing the override, because we we possibly could set that up in a constructor via some external function, perhaps. Um, but much simpler just to put it on the type-specific API. And the same as timer activator, we still need a way to get now. So we've got the same 
um, invocable concept um, going on. Maybe some of you have seen how the picture emerges here. This is what we're in basically implementing is chain responsibility, which is a gang of four pattern. It's not a new pattern by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, original chain of responsibility, the motivation was to be able to pass a message through a sequence of objects and any object that knew how to handle it would do so. Any object that didn't know how to handle it would ignore it. What we're doing here is we're passing a message through the sequence of objects from the timer all the way up to the main heating system. And any object that decides that it should filter through will let it pass. And any object that decides it should not continue drops it. So it's a filter rather than a chain. But the motivation is close enough, I think. The implementation is pretty much identical. Maybe it deserves a different pattern. I don't know, drop through filter. The basic idea of this, of filtering a message as it passes through the chain of objects, is common in lots of things. Um, so audio processing is one thing that springs to mind. And the constraints are pretty much the same as well. So chain of responsibility, for me, is good enough. But now we've hit some trouble with templates because we want to use the type specific behavior offered by the override activator in order to be able to actually say, I want to override. But declaring the shared pointer name, if we want to avoid something nasty like dynamic cast, and we do, we really do want to avoid that, Creating the shared pointer of the override activator requires the template argument. The type of the template argument is an invocable. It's the type of get name. But in this test, that is a lambda. So it's unnameable. We couldn't possibly name it even if we tried. So another pattern to the rescue. This is a simple factory method. And we sprinkle a little magic template dust with a template template parameter which helps us with the type deduction. So now we can use this function in the using code to make it make using it a bit easier. And we can use it for the other types as well. They will, um, we may need to override make activator for the non-template template types. But other than that, it's a simple factory. And the invocable concepts here is extra useful though, for encoding that intent. So it's kind of reminiscent of policy-based design, if anybody's familiar with that term, Andrei Alexandrovsky, um, introducing it in modern C++ design way back when. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. In summary, um, the main um, kind of thrust of my argument is about uncertainty informing design, about embracing uncertainty and allowing it to fuel your imagination about what you'd like the code to look like in the absence of um, any actual concrete constraints. About how you can own your own types and give them names that make sense in the context of your application. <coughs> um, how to distinguish between active objects and inactive objects um, and why that's important. So tell them, ask, in my experience, is quite often used as an absolute. And I think that there is a grayer area where some objects are active and some are not. And that forms um, the basis of something like CQRS as well, of command query responsibility separation. Most important one here, pass dependencies as arguments, whether it's to constructors or to functions, rather than reaching out hardwiring them in to reach out to some global state, some global factory, whatever it is. Extensible design is more than about object orientation. But this is using C++ in an OO sort of way. 
a classic OO sort of way. Abstract base classes is a very OO thing. So, also vice versa. <laughs> There's more to OO than extensible design. You can use it to express quite strongly the intent of your code. So, that's the main end of the talk. Um, any questions from that bit? I have bonus material if anybody wants to see it. Okay, quick point about performance. <coughs> How's this going to work? Um, standard function versus templated lambda, lambda, as we looked at in the thermostat. Um, there's nothing particularly startling about passing in a standard function. The switch to using standard invocable is exactly what we looked at just now. I set up a quick benchmark for this um, to run however many times. I've not put it on the slide. I can't remember what the numbers were. That's a bit of an oversight, isn't it? Some thousands. Doesn't matter. Um, the results kind of speak for themselves. The, um, the template is on the order of half the time taken. And it scales. Ah, so I put the capacity there. So that was 250 times. And then if I put that up to two and a half thousand times, it scales over. So again, it's there's around about 50% difference. It's possibly not startling unless you're doing these things in a tight loop. If it's a properly hot loop, then it's going to matter. If it's not a hot loop, nobody's going to care about a few milliseconds. But I did think it was interesting. The other one, and in case anybody's missing RVO on their bingo, I didn't add this today, honestly. Um, there was a suggestion made to me um, that the, uh, the activator type could be a stack-based object where you pass in it as a reference to the types that are dependent on it. And this was initially quite attractive. So our whatever activator would take that heating system by reference and just store it as a raw reference as a member. And this is safe with caution. So if you're talking about within a single stack frame, so inside main, for example, or some other function, it's fine because both the stack-based fake and the activator that holds a reference to it go out of scope at the same time. Everything's good. What would be a bad idea would be for the stack-based object lifetime to end and before, effectively before the activator object. Obviously, that's a bad idea. And yeah, a very bad idea would be to do anything with it. So I set up straw man on this where Instead of using default, I use delete on all the copy and move. Um, copy and move construction and copy and move assignment. So that they couldn't be, you couldn't copy it out, you couldn't move it out. And therefore, I thought I'd be enforcing that I could say that the lifetime of the stack-based object would match the lifetime of the thing it was that was storing a reference to it. But RVO says no. This is Compiler Explorer, <laughs> which I'm using a static assert to say that it's not copyable, it's not movable, and yet I've got a function that on the face of it copies it out. But this is an example of return value optimizer, or specifically mandatory re return value optimization kicking in. It's not being copied, it's not being moved, it's being RVO'd, and you can't prevent that. Both GCC and Clang compile it and happily run it and happily blow up 
with extremely peculiar results. Just be warned, I did this so that you didn't have to. <laughs> so that's me, all done. Thank you very much.